Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's virtual presentation, Unframed, Conserving the Portraits of Nehemiah Partridge, with Maggie Barkovic and Rachel Childers from the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. I am Patrick Stenshorn. I am the Director of Interpretive Programs at the Albany Institute. Uh, tonight, I am joined on the call uh, by Victoria Waldron, who is my colleague in the Education Department. She is listed under the, the name Albany Institute of History and Art Education. If you should have any technical issues during tonight's presentation, please feel free to send myself or Victoria a message and we would help uh, troubleshoot any issues you might be having. For tonight's presentation, uh, please make sure that your microphone is on mute. And if you are using a device that has a webcam, feel free to have that turned on or off, whichever you are most comfortable with. We will conduct a question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation using the chat function on Zoom. If you have a question for either of our speakers, please feel free to type it into the chat box and I will read all questions to the speakers at the conclusion of their presentation. Tonight's program will discuss the conservation of paintings which are currently on view in the exhibition, A Fresh Look at 18th Century Portraits at the Albany Institute. We hope that you will be able to visit and see the portraits up close and personal uh, and be able to see some of the work that you will hear about uh, tonight. Next week, we will be hosting another virtual uh, presentation for Women's History Month um, entitled Shatter Shattering Gender Barriers, Women Painters in the American Landscape Tradition. That program will be by Catherine Manthorne, who is Professor of Art History at the Cooney Graduate Center. So we hope you would be able to join us for that presentation next Thursday at 7 p.m. Now, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Maggie Barkovic is the Associate Paintings Conservator at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. Maggie has a BA in Chemistry from Virginia Polytech, Polytechnic Institute and an MA in Art History from George Mason University. She completed her training and graduate degree in the conservation of easel painting at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London with an interest in modern and contemporary paintings. She has presented research on treating water-stained acrylic paintings for the American Institute for Conservation and international academic programs. She has held internships in both paintings, conservation, and conservation science at the Barnes Foundation, Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute, the Phillips Collection, the Technische Uni Universiteit at Delft, At Atel E. Marjan de Visser in the Netherlands. She joined the WACC in January of 2017. She is also the editor and designer of WACC's publication, Art Conservator, and helped rebrand WACC after redesigning the website and branding in 2018. She is a member of the American Institute for Conservation. Rachel Childers is postgraduate fellow in paintings conservation at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. Rachel graduated in 2020 from SUNY Buffalo State with an MA in art conservation, specializing in paintings. She has completed graduate internship at the Cleveland Museum of Art, International Platform for Art Research and Conservation in Belgium, and the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. Her areas of research include the characterization and mitigation of blanched paint film, considerations of mounting medias used in cross-section analysis, as well as approaches and techniques in reconstructing large losses on painted surface. She holds a BA in art history from the University of Arizona, is in the and is the recipient of the Shirley Hamilton Memorial Art Scholarship, two Congressional Art Awards, and is a four-time recipient of the Friends of Western Art Scholarship. Rachel has returned to the Williamstown Center as a postgraduate fellow after interning here 
as a pre-program intern prior to graduate school. So please join me in welcoming Maggie and Rachel. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, in 2018, the director of the Williamstown Art Conservation Center and department head of paintings conservation, Tom Branchick, initiated a survey of the culturally significant collection of early 18th century Limner portraits in the collection held by the Albany Institute of History and Art. This survey addressed aspects of deterioration and compromise supports for the purpose of long-term preservation and exhibition at AHA. As a collaborative effort, a generous Stockman Family Foundation grant was awarded, resulting in the conservation of 35 portraits. Five of these portraits are currently on display in the Institute's exhibition, while the remain are currently being treated at the WAC. This collection of Limner or Hudson Valley Patroon paintings were made between 1700 and 1740 and document the prosperous descendants of Dutch settlers that cultivated the Hudson Valley prior to the fall of New Netherlands to the British Empire in 1664. In early 18th century Britain, the production of art was still relegated to the wealthiest members of society. Dutch migrant artists reformed the British art market by the mid 18th century by disseminating art commissions amongst the middle class since they were more affordable than their British artists. Unlike their British counterparts, the Dutch golden age of the 17th century had already produced an art market that was accessible to the working classes. The impressive sitters depicted by the Dutch limners represent landowners that were farmers, merchants, and craftsmen. It is no surprise then that this community of Dutch patroons commissioned portraits under the elite rule of the British crown to emulate the status of the ruling British class. These portraits express social prestige and financial success of their subjects and record their appearance in an age of early mortality. The Lindmers in this collection that are currently attributed in the AHA collection of colonial portraits include Ever Dukinek, and I apologize for mispronunciation of certain Dutch uh, uh, names, uh, Nehemiah Partridge, John Watson, Peter Vanderlyn, Gerardus Dukinek, and Pierpoint Limner, John Heaton, and John Wollaston. Many of the portraits they produced are primitive in technique and incorporate styles and motifs adapted by from 18th century British material culture. Historian James Thomas Flexner designated them as one of the first distinctive schools of American art. While the validity of this could be questioned, they remain to be some of the earliest examples of paintings in America and are artifacts representative of the Dutch material culture that survived English rule. Tonight, myself and our postgraduate fellow, Rachel Childers, will focus on the Atatis Sue Limner, also known as Nehemiah Partridge. Three of the portraits by Partridge that will be discussed are currently on exhibition and include the full length jewel of the collection shown on the right the portrait of Ariansha Koeman. As we present various aspects of the treatments necessary to conserve and display the significant collection, we will be considering preliminary insights into the materials and techniques used by Partridge carried out through examination and technical analysis. Paintings that are now attributed to Nehemiah Partridge were once attributed to the anonymous Atata Sue Lindner. Nearly all of his paintings have the phrase Atata Sue inscribed followed by the sitter's age and date of the painting as exemplified in this painting or portrait of Anna Kuhler Van Schaik. These inscriptions, which are on most of the portraits that were done by Nehemiah Partridge have been painted in various conformations throughout attributed um, and sometimes abbreviating or misspelling the Latin phrase. It wasn't until art historian Mary Black, whose research has been consequential for the study of these painters, identified an agreement between Everett Wendell and Partridge. This agreement lists an exchange between a prominent Dutch patroon Wendell and Nehemiah Partridge, Skilder. Skilder is the Dutch word for artist, and the list writes that a horse will be traded for 10 pounds and four portraits. Um, and this receipt is from 1718. That receipt refers to the four portraits of the Wendell family, and this portrait of a young Abraham Wendell is among the paintings exchanged between Partridge and Wendell. The other commissioned portraits are currently waiting to be imaged and treated at the center. 
The connection between Wendell and Partridge finally allowed for these paintings to be attributed to him and initiated further research into who he was, how he may have gained commissions and preliminary insights into how he might've been trained as a portrait painter. It is possible that Everett Wendell, a prosperous Boston merchant, provided the connections he needed to secure commissions in the upper Hudson Valley. Partridge was born in 1683 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and he started off in, Bo in the Boston area selling paint supplies and working as a Japaner, the European imitation of Asian lacquer work for decorative objects and furniture. Most limners were jack of all trades, advertising various decorative art skills. It is uncertain how experience as a decorative painter influenced his materials and techniques as a portrait painter. However, in many of his portraits, you will see small jewel-like jewel details, such as jewelry or buttons, have been done with more confidence and care than other parts of the composition, such as the faces, drapery, and foliage in the background. By 1717, he was living in New York and his profession was recorded as a limner in 1718 when he completed this full length portrait of Ariane Charcoyman. This painting is significant in many ways like the woman herself. It is the first full length portrait of a woman in America and only the second full length portrait to be made in this period. Partridge had completed a full length portrait of Peter Schooler, the first mayor of Albany in New York in 1717. Ariancha Koeman was a woman before her time. She commissioned this portrait at the age of 51 when she married for the first time to a man 23 years younger. By 51, she was a powerful landowner, having built one of the largest jet style houses, which is still existent, in the upper Hudson Valley. And it was this painting that our director, Tom Branchick, said he waited 30 years to treat after identifying its need for conservation in the 1980s as head of our department. The rare full length portrait features neoclassical architecture against an apocalyptic sky with reds, pinks, and oranges. Partridge often borrowed his compositions directly from British mezzotints depicting British aristocracy. His father was a wealthy merchant who became Lieutenant Governor, Governor of New Hampshire and it is perhaps this connection that helped him to gain access to Mitzo tents being brought over to the colonies. The portrait of Ariancha has been borrowed from a Mitzo tent by G. Beckett after Jeffrey Neller's portrait of a lady Bucknell. <laughs> this comparison was taken from art historical research by Belknap and Mary Black. Mitzo tents have been either directly copied or loosely translated. In Ariancha's case, the neoclassical architecture has been borrowed from the background Early studies of comparisons made between these portraits and British mezzo tents have been researched further and in detail by Belknap um, in the earlier part of the 20th century. While in conversation over the relations of mezzo tints with the portraits that my colleagues are treating, Rachel rightly pointed out the, directly, the direct comparison between Neller's mezzo tint and the portrait of Margarita Vandenberg. With the exception of the differences in the backgrounds, the motif used for the sitter's hair, posture, dress, and flowers are identical. More discoveries concerning Partridge's materials and techniques were made during the course of assessing and treating the complex condition issues in his paintings. Conservators use visible light, raking light, and ultraviolet light as some of the means to identify problematic issues for long-term preservation of these important works. In addition to general invisible light, which is on the far left, we use raking light, which is pictured in the center, and ultraviolet light, which is pictured on the far right. Raking light, or an indirect light cast at an oblique angle across the surface of the painting, can be used to identify textural differences, elucidating the construction of the support, such as canvas seams, and addi additional information, such as planar deformations, raised paint, uneven fills from previous restoration campaigns, loss, and of course, surface dirt and dust. This raking light detail of Ariancha Koyman before treatment shows the prominent canvas seam on the left that was used to connect smaller pieces of canvas to create the full length side portrait. Additionally, the lump along the seam is an old fill with overpaint, 
that as it aged, no longer matched the surrounding paint film. The matte and gray surface quality is a result of dirt and grime on the surface on top of a deteriorated varnish that is no longer working to saturate the paint film. Ultraviolet light allows us to examine the natural or synthetic resin varnishes that are applied to the surface of the paint film, their distribution, and overpaint that covers damage from previous restoration campaigns. In this example, we can see retouching along the seams in Ariantia's canvas, pointing out areas of tears and punctures, which appear dark purple. The distribution of synthetic resin varnish and natural resin uh, residues are uneven, suggesting that the painting has been selectively cleaned in the past. Prior to the establishment of the field of conservation, paintings were often repaired by a restorer or craftsman, and it is often that only the faces or whites in the composition were cleaned and that areas with pigment sensitivity were avoided. And this often results um, in uneven saturation of the painting. The portrait of Ariantia, like many others in the collection, had condition issues that required conservation treatment for its long-term preservation. These issues, which will be illustrated with examples from several paintings by Partridge, include deteriorated synthetic and natural resin varnish surface coatings, structurally compromised supports due to failed wax resin linings, resulting in cupped paint cleavage and paint loss. Abrasion to the paint film is present in all of the paintings. It may appear as a simple scratch with loss of paint as, as it is depicted in this flower belonging to the portrait of Margarita Vandenberg. It may also appear as an overall wearing of the paint film to the ground, which you can see in this detail image of Ariancha to the right of her face where the paint film appears worn. Areas of abrasion and paint that have become more translucent over time reveal red ground um, or preparatory layer in Partridge's paintings. In this image taken from the portrait of Anna Kuller von Schaep, the ground appears as a dark maroon. One of the most challenging parts of the painting's condition were wax resin linings done earlier in the 20th century. Wax resin was a popular adhesive used heavily in the mid to late 20th century to adhere the canvas to a secondary support. And this is otherwise known as a lining in conservation and helps to consolidate lifting paint. The wax was applied generously and globs of yellowed wax resin were visible along the edges and reverse of the paintings. The detail image in the center on the left shows a thick application of yellow wax resin on the reverse of a lining canvas. In these examples, the wax resin appears yellow and ranges in stiffness from a soft crayon like wax to a hard adhesive, depending upon how much resin was mixed prior to application. The wax fully impregnates the canvas and may travel through loss or micro fissures in the paint to the front of the painting. These globs of yellow wax that can sometimes travel to the front of the painting are visible in the other detailed pictures in this slide. The overall reverse of the lining canvas appears yellow and waxy. And, and that is the reverse of the canvas on the left uh, part of this slide. As these linings deteriorate, they fail to consolidate any adhesion issues between the paint and ground, as well as fail to support old tears or holes in the canvas. Many have been reversed and will continue to be. Due to significant scientific developments in the field of conservation, wax linings have all been abandoned for adhesives that have better reversibility and aging properties. Due to the failure of the wax resin to consolidate adhesion between ground and paint layers, there was localized raised paint that required stabilization and loss that was visually disruptive. On the far left, a raking light image shows sharp, tenting and cut paint that is lifting from the canvas support. Wax is highly responsive to changes in humidity and temperature, allowing for this movement over a long period of time. Many of the losses were old and some had not been filled or retouched depending upon where they were located in the composition. As mentioned with problematic wax linings, unfortunately, previous interventions don't always age sympathetically. 
Aesthetic issues include mismatched or discolored retouching and fills that covered original paint and are texturally distracting. The overpaint and fills in these areas would need to be removed during the cleaning process to allow us conservators to properly fill them and reintegrate them with reversible retouching so they match the surrounding paint film. Mismatched or discolored retouching and fills that cover original paint are easily identifiable in both visible and UV light. This UV uh, ultraviolet image shows previous restoration and retouching in dark purple. Previous campaigns were extensive throughout the collection, whether they were painted by Partridge or as contemporaries. In addition to noting the retouching and surface coatings in UV, we can also take note of certain pigments that fluoresce within the UV light spectrum. One such pigment is Red Lake, shown here as a pink fluorescence in the rose held by the sitter. While the fluorescence of the surface coatings over the painted surface tend to subdue the fluorescence of most pigments, certain ones such as Red Lake have such a strong fluorescence that their presence can be at times easily detectable. Since we began treating the collection, we noticed all of the artists in the collection had used Red Lake, a dye-based pigment. A Red Lake is an organic dye derived from various organic materials, such as various classes of sap and wood, Brazil wood to name one. Additional sources of Red Lake include Kermes, Mataru, and Cochineal, which is derived from a beetle. These pigments have been used for centuries and are ground in oil or resin and valued for their translucent and bright shades of magenta and violet hues that are often applied over red vermilion and other pigments as delicate glazes. Oftentimes they are also mixed with these pigments to alter their color and vibrancy. Here are a few examples of their use in the collection of Dutch Moonlight portraits. For example, to create delicate glazes on a rose or be mixed with other pigments to create Partridge's signature, almost fluorescent-like skies. The Dutch of New Netherlands had a monopoly on the trade of both cochineal and Brazil wood, which is a type of dye wood, that they harvested in their Central American and Caribbean territories. These documents from the 17th century, translated by the New Netherlands Institute in Albany, show that these pigments made their entrance to the colonies as early as the 1650s, by 1654, both Brazil wood, i.e. dye wood, and cochineal contributed to be uh, traded. After the British took over in 1664, the British government forbade trade with the Netherlands, but many colonists and Native Americans preferred Dutch manufactured goods. This resulted in a smuggling trade and prompted many Dutch American settlers to train as craftsmen. It is of interest to find out where our limners sourced the Red Lake materials during the period in which they were made. We decided to use this opportunity to do further analysis on the materials present, from the canvas to the preparatory layers to the final glazes. I broke the research down into three phases, on-site technical analysis, hosting a lake making workshop here at the WAC, and finally, off-site analysis at Williams College, where we have partnered with the chemistry department to perform more in-depth analysis into the chemical and molecular structures of the pigments used to create the artist's palette. Initial analysis included handheld X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. This technique involves the use of handheld X-ray fluorescence spectrometer that irradiates a point of the painting with high energy X-rays in order to determine the material's elemental components. While light elements below sodium are unreliably identified or detected with the XRF, heavier elements such as lead can easily be detected. XRF is able to penetrate through some surface uh, materials like grime, dirt, and varnish in order to get a better understanding of the composition of the layers beneath the surface. In the painting shown here of Abraham Wendell, we have identified the presence of lead, mercury, and iron. Based on this information, it is likely that lead white was used in the upper layers of paint to create a highlight, the mercury containing pigment vermilion was used to create the shade of pink, and iron likely indicates an ochre or other earth tones pigments in the ground. Samples were taken in areas of loss as seen um, at the right through the ocular of a microscope in order to better understand the stratigraphy of the paint layers. Those samples were then mounted in an epoxy and polished along the side for cross-section analysis. This is similar to cutting into a cake and looking at all of the layers. 
to give some perspective as to the scale of the samples, the average human hair is approximately 80 micrometers. Using the 50 micrometer scale in the image as reference, the sample is roughly 400 micrometers, which is approximately the width of five human hairs. While the samples are small, we've been able to gain an immense amount of information from each sample. This one here shows the presence of Red Lake as identified by both its warm fluorescence in the center UV image, but also the color and shape of the pigments. Through analyzing these samples, we have found that Nehemiah Partridge's preparation of the Red Lakes varied throughout the paintings. For instance, the Red Lake used to create the modeling in the sitter's costume was here mixed with lead in order to, uh, lead white in order to give more body and opacity and create a pink shade. The preparation and type of Red Lakes used in this collection of Dutch Patroon portraits varies heavily depending upon the artist. In this example, again, we see a mixture of lead white mixed with small magenta colored shards of red lake pigment and a small round vermilion uh, pigment particles. Here, red lake was mixed with vermilion in order to create a deeper, more vibrant shade of red used to create his vibrant and often apocalyptical looking backgrounds. In the portrait of Elsia Wendell Schuler, painted by the Dutch limner Everett Dukinek, the layer contained red lake, containing red lake does not have much lead white mixed in and appears as a more homogeneous, almost jelly-like application of a rich magenta glaze used to paint her pink cuffs, rose, and lips. And for those who are looking at the two images of the cross sections on the right, we're looking at that deep magenta, um, almost jelly-like second layer um, from the top that also fluoresces a slight uh, pink in the UV or ultraviolet image. This portrait of Jan Baptist Rensselaer has been painted by a Scottish artist and UK trained John Watson. He used larger lake particles that are more purple in color. This again indicated that sources and methods of preparation for this expensive and prized class of pigments varied heavily in early 18th century New York. This raises questions about again, where the red lake pigments were sourced and how their identification may contribute to knowledge about trade or maybe how the Anglo-Dutch wars may have impacted the types of materials that the limners used. In his portrait of Garrett Tunis van Vechten, Partridge again uses lead white to give more body to the paint film where he created the facial features. The artist various uses of red lakes as a medium were also found in the preparatory layer. In analyzing the type of red lake uh, lake pigments present in the paintings, we noticed variants in ground preparation amongst a variety of limners and within Partridge's own body of work. Um, and the ground or preparatory layers is what an artist used to prepare either their canvas or panels prior to the application of paint. Um, and just to give a little bit of reference, uh, his Dutch limner counterparts were using a traditional off-white or gray ground um, that was used heavily in the 17th century Dutch paintings. This is evident in the portrait of Elsia Wendel Schuler by Everett Dukine. We see in this first layer, which is at the bottom, and it appears white or off-white, sort of gray in color. That's the ground or preparatory layer. In the portrait of Jan Baptist Rensselaer, um, we again have a much more thick, but also a gray preparatory layer that is derived from the anglo netherlandish style that was developed in London due to the presence of Netherlandish immigrant artists. However, as illustrated by the small cross-section taken from the portrait of Anthony van Schaik, Partridge is using a red ground. There is nothing unusual about using a red preparatory layer. Red grounds were made popular during the Italian Renaissance and used famously by artists such as Titian and Rubens, lending a warm glow to the palette. What is unusual is the triple preparatory layer that Partridge used. And this cross section is quite complex with 15 different layers. These are larger images taken from the previous uh, cross sections and show a complex sample that is comprised of a thick blue size layer at the very bottom that appears transparent. Um, and then we have the first layer of the preparatory ground. It's very, very thin and red and has a slight fluorescence and appears as a very thin homogeneous layer. The next layer is much thicker and appears to contain a mixture of vermilion and earth pigments. 
On top of that layer, there is another thin, which is hard to discern um, in either image without really blowing it up, but is another thin layer of a slight fluorescing pigment um, that is red in nature. And again, almost, it sort of appears like a thin layer of jelly. Um, <clears throat> the use of this small thin uh, red layer above and below the thicker application of red ground that's comprised of vermilion and earth pigments is very interesting. This preparatory layer is again visible in this sample from Garrett Denise Van Vechten. We typically see a double ground in the 18th century separated by a layer of glue. This triple layered pre preparatory method um, is unusual and is repeated in various portraits that we have treated by Partridge. These samples will be stained to determine what layers contain a proteinaceous glue layer and which contain oil. Following microchemical staining, they will be sent to Williams College for analysis with SEM-EDX, which will identify the inorganic pigments that are present in his grounds. For someone without supposed training, ascertaining what type of ground he used may elucidate more about his development as an artist and from where he was borrowing, uh, what traditions he was borrowing his techniques from. Uh, furthermore, SEM-EDX will also help to identify the inorganic substrates used to make the red lake pigments that Rachel is trying to identify. In addition to cross-section analysis, we perform polarized light microscopy on loose pigment samples, which allows us to examine the pigments under the microscope and compare them to known samples. On the left is ground cochineal that's used to make red lake, and on the right is a sample from the portrait of Anya Kulir von Schaeck. We examine the particles in normal light, shown here, and in cross-polar, seen here, where the light used to examine the particles is focused solely on the particles themselves. By comparing particle size, shape, hue, refractive index, and various ways in which, the, um, in which they interact with filtered and unfiltered light, we could better identify the pigment. In order to understand the Red Lake material better, I hosted a Red Lakes workshop at the WAC with two of our pre-program interns, Lila Reed and Jonah Jablons. In preparation for the workshop, we had researched several different historic Red Lake recipes that we could use to recreate a similar pigment used by the limners. <laughs> We are incredibly grateful for the guidance and additional resources provided by Joe Kirby, who has carried out documentary research into the history of painting, painting materials and methods for years, including the preparation of pigments and paints for scientific research and reconstructive purposes. We decided to make several different lake recipes that required different natural resources, uh, natural, natural sources for their base. The first was cochineal dye, which is a dye extracted from the cochineal insect found in the Southwest and in several areas throughout South America. I'm personally quite familiar with the insect as I grew up seeing the white spider web like nesting material on the prickly pear cactus in my family's backyard in Tucson, Arizona. Last December, my parents cut paddles covered with the cochineal seen in the center and mailed them to the lab so the insects could be harvested. The video on the right shows the bugs being extracted from the cactus. Once the bugs were collected, they were laid out to dry, then put in wax uh, temperature and humidity controlled oven to further desiccate them. Then they were ground and used to create the pigment. The second dye was created from matter root, which is largely sourced from the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean. The materials itself is more complex than cochineal and its preparation requires a more careful control of temperatures through the extraction process. The root was cut into small pieces and like the cochineal ground, in order to extract the dye stuff, the natural material was placed in boiling water, filtered, then an alkali and metallic salt are added. In our case for cochineal and matter, we use potassium carbonate and potash alum and the solution shown in the video on the right starts to effloresce or foam slightly as the reaction proceeds and the pig pigment begins to precipitate to the bottom. It is then filtered and left to dry. Once the various shades of cochineal and matter dried, the pigments were ground first in a mortar and pestle, then mold in a glass slab with linseed oil in order to uh, create a transparent glaze similar to those used by the limners. We next plan to combine the glazes with a white pigment, 
to recreate the flesh tones and a heavier body or red to recreate that ap apocalyptic sky. In order to expand on our understanding of the materials on a molecular level, we partnered with Williams uh, Chemistry Department to run samples for paintings using scanning electron microscope with energy dispersive X-ray analysis or SEMEDX and high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. On the top, you can see two spectra gained from HPLC analysis, both of carminic acid, which is a main component of Red Lakes. The images on the bottom show the actual SEM unit on the left and particles from a sample captured using SEM analysis are shown on the bottom right with a five micrometer scale, which is roughly 1 16th the, size, the width of a human hair. We have sent samples to Williams, uh, the lake samples that we created, we sent them to Williams to, um, so that they can use them as a standard during their analysis. In addition to collaborating with Williams College, we have reached out to domestic and international institutions such as Colonial Williamsburg and Joe Kirby in the UK in order to get better insights into the limners, red lakes, and sample preparation for these scientific analyses. The research is ongoing, but we're hoping to share more of our findings closer to the fall. The ongoing investigation into the materials and techniques used by Partridge and his contemporaries has helped to understand um, localized discoloration, fading, and changes in the paint film to inform our approach to treatment. While there is no one treatment path to conserve a painting, the most common initial step for the AHA collection was to aqueously clean the surface of water-soluble dirt and grime, followed by reducing yellowed varnish and discolored overpaint through the application of free solvents, solvent combinations, and or solvent gels. As you can see in the time-lapse video on the right taken during cleaning, this portrait attributed to John Heaton in, Albany, uh, in the Albany collection had a significantly yellowed varnish. Reducing the yellowed varnish allows the true tones of the sitter's hair and complexion to return to life, but it also reveals the extensive loss in the face. At some point in the painting's life, the eyes were physically abraded away. Here's the same painting before and after varnish reduction. While abrasion to the paint along the margins where the stretcher or strainer is nested is common in paintings, this painting was in the worst condition out of all the paintings in the collection that came through the lab. The most significant condition issue is the abrasion seen in the areas above the sitter's hand. It is believed that during a previous restoration campaign, the individual cleaning the painting had wrongly believed that the bird perched on the sitter's extended hand was non-original and that the figure had originally gestured to the land in the background, similar to the two Nehemiah Partridge uh, paintings on the right. So since he decided it was unoriginal, he proceeded with the cleaning and left an abraded surface. Unfortunately, it was until after the restoration campaign that it was discovered that the bird was indeed original to the composition. The painting is currently in treatment, which involves the reconstruction of the bird. In the hopes of uncovering additional information to help inform the reconstruction, the sitter's hand was x-rayed. The center detail image shows the transition from normal light to the X radiograph. While the X ray doesn't show the sil or shows the silhouette of the bird, I will be relying on the areas of abraded paint to match the bird in hue. In terms of the detail and anatomy of the bird, I will defer to another painting in the lab. Uh, shown on the right is a detail, um, another portrait by Heaton that depicts a swallow like bird currently in the lab being treated by assistant paintings conservator Mary Holland. After surface cleaning, we address the removal of the wax resin adhesive and associated linings. The failure of these old linings necessitated the removal and preparation of new lining canvases with a reversible thermoplastic adhesive. This image shows the reverse of Ariancha's portrait after removal of the wax lining canvas that had been originally attached to it and reveals the reason behind why a conservator would line a canvas to an auxiliary support. Many of the canvases sustain tears, punctures, holes, and fissures along the seams over um, the course of its age. Large tears are often consolidated and supported by a lining canvas in lieu of small patches to ensure long-term structural stability. In the case of Ariancha, several pieces of canvas have been sewn together to create the full-length portrait, 
since rolls of that size were not available to the artist. Over three centuries, the seams become brittle and need additional support. The delining process or removal of the wax impregnated lining canvas reveals the reverse of the original support and residues from previous repairs such as patches. Removal requires both heat and mechanical action to release the wax, followed by aromatic solvents to reduce remaining wax residues. It was difficult to remove all of the residues from the wax resin lining. They could be removed through aromatic solvents, but not completely. And in some cases, it remained impregnated in the interstices of the canvas weave, but reduced to allow for an even relining process and good adhesion between the new lining canvases, which we would detach. The ability to view, re, to view the reverse of the canvases after delining allowed us to observe previous restoration campaigns. On the left, we see residues in the shape of rectangles and squares around old tears that had been previously repaired. Prior to the old wax lining, these tears were once supported with patches made by canvas and other similar materials. The delining process also has allowed us to take inventory of the different supports Partridge used for his paintings. Both a fine plain weave, estimated linen canvas, and 18th century mattress ticking fabric was observed after removal of wax lining canvases from the reverse of Dutch Patroon portraits. The length of the rolls Partridge used has not been determined yet. However, we are using the sizes from paintings that have returned, uh, retained their original tacking the margins and dimensions and ones that have seems to make some guesses about the roll length. Further research and, the loc and locating trading documents that show the purchase or import of canvas could help with this. While I won't go into detail on the delining and lining process as that was so elegantly covered by our colleague Mary Holland last week, I wanna mention that the collection of Nehemiah Partridge paintings underwent the same condition treatment. I'm shown here during the relining of Partridge's portrait of Jakob Tunbroek, ensuring an even vacuum prior to turning on the heat that activates the adhesive, generating a bond between the original canvas and its new secondary support. Here's the verso of the painting on the right prior to lining, showing the wax infused lining support. And after the painting was lined to a more sympathetic fabric, the verso appears both structurally and aesthetically improved. After the paintings were cleaned, relined, and stretched, they were ready to be filled and retouched. An isolating layer of a reversible synthetic varnish was applied prior to filling and retouching to saturate the painting. Filling and retouching was used to reintegrate damage and abrasion. In some cases where lacuna and the canvases were large, small inserts of linen fabric were cut to the size of the hole and attached to the surrounding canvas fibers to provide support for the fill and to mimic the uh, texture of the canvas weave uh, through the thinly painted surface. Retouching is done judiciously, only integrating areas of loss and with the understanding of the materials and techniques used by the artist and their aging properties. It is done with pigments ground in synthetic resin so that it remains reversible. After retouching is complete, the final layers of saturating and protecting varnish is applied. In his portrait of Jakob Tenenbroek, there were significant areas of loss in the chin that were retouched to integrate them back into the composition. The next images will illustrate before and after Im uh, treatment images of the Dutch Patroon portraits by Partridge that have already been conserved at the center or on, or are on display. Final treatment steps included framing and backboarding. And in some cases, the frames themselves needed treatment for either loss or abrasion. Most of them were not original to the paintings and some aesthetic changes have been made. In this example for the frame for Garrett Tunis van Vechten, the frame was toned to match the aesthetic of the other frames from this period and within the collection. The same was done for the pendant pair, Portrait of Margarita van Vechten. As we show you the results from conserving this collection, it has been an incredible opportunity to learn more about the first paintings in colonial America.
and the sitters who posed for them. We hope that you will enjoy seeing them in present and upcoming exhibitions at AHOF. We will continue to work on identifying aspects of Partridge's materials and techniques in the meantime. Further research into the materials and techniques used by Partridge may help affirm loose or unknown attributions, as well as provide historical context for the types of pigments and materials used in the changing tides of trade in 18th century British America. We'd like to thank you for your attention and we'd like to especially thank the Stockman Family Foundation who generously supported the conservation of these works, the Albany Institute of History and Art, Williams College, Joe Kirby, previously of the National Gallery London, and our colleagues at WAC. Please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, Maggie and Rachel, thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Um, do you want to explain a little bit about where you actually are right now? Sure. Um, we are actually, we're in the anical, uh, analytical lab at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. So there are microscopes and uh, other fun instrumentations. We have a chemical lab or hood over there. Uh, so um, we are very, very fortunate uh, as a regional center that we have an analytical lab um, in which we can do um, analysis. I'm very fortunate to have the chemistry department at Williams College just down the road um, so that in the event we don't have that type of inorganic or organic analysis here, um, we have our partners down the street that can help us with that. That's great. Um, let's see, we have a question from Karen about, uh, would there have been a danger to the artist's health because of the use of lead and mercury? Absolutely, yeah. They are toxic materials, they're toxic elements. Um, but there's, I don't know if there's a lot of cases of them actually dying from it. I don't expect they had a particularly long lifespan during that time anyway, so. Yeah, m mostly, especially um, after, you know, age uh, continues to go up. So let's say 19th century people are living a lot longer. The famous cases of Van Gogh, you know, that he uh, used so much lead white that it helped uh, contribute to his mental health disorder. Let's see, uh, Elizabeth said, beautiful job with the treatments. Um, she's also come across damages to a sitter's eyes in particular. Do you think it's possible that this sort of thing could have been intentional? Yeah, um, I think it, I, it's hard to say if it was intent or if it was not intentional because it is so localized to the eyes. If it was some sort of abrasion or crease that went across the entirety of the surface, then that could indicate that the painting was rolled at one point or even folded. Um, but because that all of those losses were just specific to the eyes, that to me indicates that someone it was it was some sort of graffiti or um, it could have even happened during that time period and maybe it was the brother or something. So, so it could, you know, I never know what, um, what the, the history of the painting uh, was. So I do think it was intentional in that case. So. Was there any particular aspects that surprised you during the conservation process? During the treatment things? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, during the treatment, during the, the whole the whole process, was there anything that just stood out that kind of surprised you? Um, I would say uh, twofold. Um, from, I guess, a materials and techniques aspect, um, especially looking at the preparatory uh, layer that Partridge used, um, I thought that was very surprising. His, uh, um, the stratigraphy that's present in his cross sections as compared to um, either the Dutch Limmer counterparts or even uh, his UK partner counterparts that were within the same, the same group. So that, that was surprising. Um, and for the most part, a lot of these paintings, you know, they've stayed together and have been treated together for quite a long time. Um, but I was still surprised that um, even though they've, they've been together for so long and treated similarly, 
Uh, for instance, when we talked about surface coatings and removal of surface coatings, um, I was surprised that really each painting is different. And we often find that in conservation that due to the way um, the painting is, is, is made um, and even you know, material history can differ between paintings in the same pendant, pendant pair. Um, so uh, that, you know, it keeps us on our toes. We're always, uh, you know, expecting the unexpected. Uh, Lucinda asked, um, she said, uh, perhaps I missed it, but do you know why the artist did not put his name on the works? Good question. Yeah, it is a really good question. Um, you know, it really depends too. You have a lot of um, and it is certainly if there are any art historians that want to jump on this one too. But uh, even between the 17th century and 18th century, a lot of paintings aren't signed. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that artists work in studios. And we're even expecting that while we have these loose attributions to Nehemiah Partridge as that kind of sole romantic artist concept, he was probably working in a studio with other helpers that were helping him to paint maybe aspects of the landscape or inscriptions. Um, and because of this idea of uh, an artist studio, which goes back to the Renaissance and medieval period, um, typically things weren't signed unless the work was highly valuable and that artist was you know, a rock star in his day and age. Um, it's really not until um, the 19th century that you get the idea of the lone artist who would typically sign their artworks. Uh, Pat asked, how much does the media, uh, board versus canvas versus linen, affect uh, the conservation work? Um, it can. Uh, it, it impacts the methodology. Um, for instance, uh, all of the paintings that we're treating at WAC have all been done on canvas, although they're varying different supports. Um, within the ones that are done on canvas, if they were one piece because they were a smaller portrait size, that can make structural work a bit easier. If they were stitched together um, from multiple pieces, um, those seams, which can age and become brittle over time, often need um, further repair than just a single piece of canvas. Um, depending upon whether they used a medium weight canvas versus a very fine weight canvas is all going to impact the structural integrity of that of that canvas and the things that we do to it. Um, and canvas of course is different from wood in that the damage done to it is usually tears, punctures. We have uh, two panels in the collection that are not by Partridge um, that require structural work. And panels are different in that um, they're usually made of multiple pieces of wood that have been joined together. And with panels, um, it's a completely different ball game because uh, as a hygros, you know, linen is hygroscopic, but wood tends to <clears throat> expand um, and contract in uh, relationship to relative and humidity and temperature, and it can cause splits. And so instead of having, you know, you wouldn't line a panel, but you would have to address the splits and um, any issues with structural integrity. Uh, Ruth asked if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, matter and its use. It's a wonderful color. It is a great color, big fan. Um, so it is a root um, that you, uh, we had we had purchased it uh, commercially, but it, it can be found in the Mediterranean, but it is a good source for dye material. Um, and uh, yeah, it's basically used similarly to a lake. Um, if you, do paint, um, or if you are an, are an artist, it uses those final glazes that you would uh, create over skin tones, over flesh tones, to kind of give it a little bit more vibrancy in life. Um, when we had made it, uh, it doesn't have, uh, from the recipes that we're using, it doesn't have a really high yield, but it has a really nice vibrancy in its tone uh, compared to the cochineal, where depending on the recipe, uh, cochineal can be a lot more transparent. So I think matter has a little bit more body to it, but if you have the right ingredients um, uh, and a stove top, then you can make your own uh, matter. <laughs> Highly recommend. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, have you found problems when white lead is used for adhesive for canvas? Definitely. Um, there are, uh, I have not encountered any lead white linings um, on the canvases that I've treated within this collection, um, but there are uh, multiple challenges that can be posed by that. Uh, one is that lead is an incredibly stable, stable material. And because lead is a very heavy element, it actually increases the stability of uh, the oil it can be ground in or resin. And so a lot of lead white um, linings are made with a mixture of lead, resin. Um, sometimes people add animal glue and other various things to the mixture. Um, but one, it is a huge health hazard uh, for a conservator to remove. Um, you can use things like uh, lasers or different types of solvent gels um, to remove it and quite possibly decrease the amount of hazards to your health. But of course, proper precautions have to be used, like doing any kind of removal in um, uh, you know, a, a space that's marked as you know, uh, a hazard and wearing protective gear. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is because uh, lead white can become very brittle over time and is a siccative you typically have delamination between the primary canvas and the lining canvas, and it can turn um, what should be a flat two-dimensional two artwork into um, a very crispy potato chip with lots of deformations in it. Um, so whenever those come about, and no, certainly didn't have any in this collection, but when they do come out, we sort of weigh those pros and cons between uh, whether it's worth um, the risk to both the painting and the conservator to remove it. Uh, India asked, uh, what is your favorite part of the process? Sure, um, I'm a big fan of retouching. So I, I love retouching large areas of loss, kind of losses um, uh, sprinkled throughout the composition. Um, working on the bird right now has been really fun. Um, uh, yeah, so I would say, um, I would say, yeah, my favorite is, is retouching. And I, I'm very boring because I second that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other parts of the, you know, treatment are very challenging and, uh, you know, very interesting. Um, but there's something about, you know, stitching together, very satisfying about uh, stitching together the damage and retouching. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen asks if you could speak about the reconstruction of Arianja's necklace. Unfortunately, I can't speak to that specifically because um, Arianja uh, in, in total was treated by Tom Branchick, who's not here tonight. Um, and so he did the retouching um, on the portrait. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, so that was the last question that has come through so far. I will give it another uh, just few seconds to see if anybody else, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the box. But while we're just waiting to see if any questions come through, uh, Maggie and Rachel, I want to definitely thank you um, for your presentation tonight. Um, it was Excellent. It was very informative. I see some. I see a couple of people who are giving you the virtual uh, uh, round of applause. Um, so, if nobody else has any other questions uh, for Rachel or uh, Maggie tonight, um, then I think this would be a good time to end our program. Thank you, everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Maggie, for joining us. Um, and we can't wait to see uh, the rest of the work on the, on the rest of the paintings that you are currently working on too. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Maggie. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks so much, thank Patrick. You. And thank you.